This is where we stopped yesterday. We saw that model fitting with L1 noise is equivalent to assuming a noise model where the noise follows a Laplace distribution, which is a symmetric exponential distribution. Whereas least square corresponds to assuming the noise is Gaussian. And the difference between Laplace and Gaussian is that Laplace has a heavier tail. Uh, large noise values are less unlikely than with Gaussian. We saw that when we do the, least, the, the fitting in log scale of our virus expansion data, whether we do least square or uh, L1, we obtain the same thing when there is no outlier. However, if one of the values is completely wrong, then the least squares does see an impact, whereas the L1 quasi no impact here. And this is the celebrated value of doing, taking the L1 norm instead of L2. It's the robustness to outliers, which is uh, consistent with what I said about the noise. To understand even more what least square versus um, L1 is doing, let's analyze manually with all details, explicitly, perhaps the simplest uh, fitting model, this one. I have a set of values, y1, y2, y3, etc. And I want to fit them to a single number. So it looks like a stupid thing, but that's what we do when we summarize a set of data. And we want to say, well, let me summarize with the mean or the median or whatever. We summarize them as one single number because we think they're all close together and we're trying to estimate this number with the, point, with the cloud of points. Let's understand what happens if we do both least square or L1 norm minimization. So in both cases, we are saying every data point I have obtained for every index i is equal to this value m, m is a single number, no, which is unknown, is fixed plus unknown, plus noise in both cases and the distribution of the noise is different. What is the value of m that we obtain in both cases? Right. So let's start with least square. And we have a perfect uh, uniform distribution where b, c, d are equally chosen. Let's look at the solution. Let's We can interpret least square as minimizing a score, and the score is the sum of the error square. Now the error is y, y minus m, because the model is m for everyone. Right? So with the usual variance formula, we can easily see that the sum of the yi minus m is the, so this is the L square, the L2 distance from y to a fixed number, if I introduce the mean, so y bar is 1 over i, the sum of the, of the y. The, it's called the sample mean. Then with uh, very little of mass, we see that this is equal to that plus i m minus y bar square. Right. That's a formula that is used, for example, when we compute variances. And you can verify it easily by simply expanding what is y bar. It's not very funny, but it's too. Well, this tells us what? Now, remember, the problem we're solving is optimizing with respect to m. Yi, the data, is fixed. So we want to find the m that minimizes this. The y is fixed, so y bar is fixed also. So this is a fixed quantity. So the only question that remains, what's the value of m that minimizes this? And obviously, this is y bar. So the answer is y bar. So that's a two-line proof which is a bit too simple, perhaps. Let's look at another proof, which is more in line with the general method. I said that least square, when it's linear, is completely solved. So let's verify that it's completely solved here. We have this theorem that says how to compute uh, linear regression, how to solve the least square problem when things are linear, linear with respect to the parameter. So here the parameter is m, Beta is m, a single dimensional parameter, the beta parameter of this model. And it is linear with m in the sense that the data y depends linearly on m, obviously. This requires finding the design matrix x, so we need to put this into a formula 
which is the column vector of all the y data points. And so here, for some reason, I went to upper, from uppercase to lowercase, but it doesn't matter. So this can be written in this form, a matrix with one everywhere, everywhere, multiplied by m plus epsilon. Epsilon is the vector of all coordinates here. That gives us the, the x matrix. So the x matrix is a column matrix. There is one row per data point and one column per dimension of the vector beta. Here only one column, therefore. So once we have that, that's the only thing we need to do manually or somehow it is ad hoc to the model we're studying. Once we have that, we apply this formula here. We, we need to compute x transpose x. So x transpose x is this times that, which if we do, this is a sum of ones as many times as there are data points, so capital I. So this is just a number I equal to the number of data points. Then the projection matrix K is equal to the inverse of this matrix. So this matrix is a one by one matrix, it's just a number, one over I, times the transpose of X, which is a line vector with ones everywhere. That's the K matrix. I apply the K matrix to the data point, the vector Y. So I apply this to Y, that gives a one vector applied to that. That gives the sum of all the Y divided by I, which is Y bar. Here. So this is uh, what the theory tells us, and of course we find the same as before. Okay, same question now with L1 instead of L2. Minimum deviation, minimum absolute deviation instead of minimum least squares. Now the majority has become cautious and says the median, which is a good guess. That's the correct answer. It is the median. A bit more difficult to understand why, but let's do it. So, same thing, we have an optimization problem in one variable, m, and we need to minimize this. So, I need to minimize the function of one variable, f of m, given by this. So, I plot f of m. To plot it, it's easy to do it if we sort the values of y. So, I call y1 with parentheses around the index to mean the smaller, y2 the second, etc. Right. So, what is this f of m? Well, when y, y, uh, what is, where's the end there? When y, y is, uh, f of m is, m. yes, so for example, when m is between the first and the second point, so when m is here, then the only question we have is what is the sign of all those things, right? So it is m minus y1, which is positive here, and all the others have a negative sign, so I've reverted here, right? So this is the value of this function. And so we can easily see that between two values of y, assuming all the values of y are distinct, this is a linear function. And the expression will change only when we cross the boundary of a value of y. So it's a piecewise linear function. And it's continuous also because absolute value is continuous. So it's a combination of continuous operations. So there is no gap. And we can also compute the derivative, the slope of this, which is not defined at the breakpoint, but is defined everywhere else. For example, if we are between y1 and y2 in this interval, we see that we have one plus, one positive part here. If I take the derivative with respect to m, it will give me plus one once. And then all the other points will give me a minus one. So it will be minus three here. So the derivative here will be minus three. Here it will be uh, minus four. So in general, the derivative is the number of points in the y series that are below m minus the number of points that are above m. And therefore, when m is the median, so if, n, if the number of points i is odd in particular, then we see that it decreases when m is below the median and it increases when m is above the median. For example, here we see the median is y3, the third, third point. It's negative on the left and positive on the right, just by counting uh, the, number of, the number of things. So at least when ed is odd, it's very clear what is the minimum. The minimum is the median. When i is even, 
uh, there is a small complication. When i is even, the interval in the middle will be, the slope will be zero. There are just as many points on the right as on the left. So the slope will be zero. So the minimum is reached for anything between the two points in the middle. In that case, we know the median is not uniquely defined, and traditionally, we take the middle of this interval. So the mi in that case, too, the middle of the interval is a minimizer. Right? So take home message, the uh, minimizer here is the median. Right? So that gives us a third interpretation of what L1 minimization, or the third interpretation of the properties of L1 minimization. The first one was saying, well, the distribution of noise is, allows more heavy tail. We saw that that led to a second consequence, that it would be robust to outliers. But here we can understand more why it is robust by outliers, because it's not counting the values, but simply the order of the values. It's comparing the values. So if I change the minimization problem here, if one of the values changes dramatically, uh, it will change one of the intervals. Right? But as we know for the median, if one of the value changes, it might change the median value by one, it will be y2 instead of y3. Or if we are more lucky, if the largest value is the one that you change, then it will not change the median at all. So this robustness comes from the fact that, like many other things we've seen before, this is based on order statistics, which are inherently more robust to outliers here. If we go a bit beyond, uh, if, if we compare how we obtain, for example, confidence interval for the thing we estimate, the big theorem I said before will give a confidence interval. So, but we know also from the very first week when we studied confidence interval for the mean, we know that the confidence interval requires an estimation of the uh, standard deviation and requires also n to be fair. Uh, and that's it in that case, if the noise is Gaussian. If what we're estimating is the median, which is what we do when we have L1 norm minimization, the confidence interval, as we know, for the median is given by order of statistics. Right? So we find the second property that we expect that they go together, L1, Laplace noise, and order statistics. We can do also linear regression, but not in closed form, when there is L1 minimization, so when we minimize the uh, absolute uh, value of the errors, the sum of the absolute value of the errors. It's very similar, but as we will see, the technical problems are, are different. The technical solutions are different. So the model is the same, except now we assume, so when we say linear regression, as before, it means the dependency on the parameter is linear. And L1, if the noise is assumed to be Laplace noise. Then this can be solved by minimizing what? Minimizing the sum of absolute value, which is a weird function that is non-smooth, non-linear. However, there is a trick, which says if you want to minimize the sum of the absolute value of the errors, those are the errors. Why? the ith value of y minus x beta, which is the true value, if there would be no noise, the ith coordinate. This is the error. So what we're minimizing is the sum of the absolute value. But the absolute value of a number can be written in a form that it is equal to the maximum of two things. The absolute value of x is the maximum of what? X and minus x. Exactly, of x and minus x. Of course, that's not very helpful for us to compute. We remove the sign. That's what we do in our head. But another way to look at it, it's the maximum of x and minus x. So we're minimizing the maximum of this and that. The sum of the minimum of this and that. So the usual trick when you have maximum and linear thing is to remove the maximum by introducing additional variables. Here I've introduced one variable per element here, which I call ui. And if I minimize the sum of the ui, where I impose that ui is larger than those two things, which is x and minus x. So in other words, I'm imposing that ui is larger than or equal to the absolute value of the ith error. And I take the sum of the ui, but I want the sum to be as small as possible. 
So given the values of the errors, since ui have no constraints other than being lower bounded by the absolute value of the errors, if we want to minimize this, this, we take the smallest possible value for ui, which is exactly the absolute value, the largest of the two things here. If I take anything larger, my score function here will be larger, so it will not be the solution. Right? So, what does it tell us? Why do we do that? Well, because here it's, everything is linear. The objective function is linear. The constraints on the variables are, they are, they can take any values. And the other constraints here are linear constraints. In, now the variables are beta and u, right? Beta and u are the variables. Beta because that's what I want, and u because I've introduced them as dummy variables. Take home message. Solving a linear regression problem with L1 instead of L2 is not as nice. We don't have a closed form formula, but still it's a linear program. So linear programs can be solved relatively easily up to hundreds of thousands of variables and larger if you, if you, if you want to work a bit more. So it's doable today. So whenever we have a choice between L2 and L1, in principle, if there's no other reason no other evidence that L2 is the correct model. L1 is more robust and is perfectly doable. It's less known because, of course, it's more complicated to solve a linear program than to just apply a matrix uh, computation, although if you have MATLAB, it's hardly uh, different. Right? We also know that the maximum likelihood of the noise parameter, the maximum likelihood estimation of the noise parameter, is 1 over the average value of the noise, is 1 over the average, exactly, one over the average value of the noise. So minus one, sum of the absolute value of the error terms here. This is what I did here uh, when, again, for Joe's shop, I did L1 instead of L2. And we have the same problem. If the turning point psi is not known, then we have a nonlinear problem. And I solve this nonlinearity by using the same trick as in the previous case. I assume C is fixed, and I solve it using the linear program. And I do that for every value of C. And I write the score that I obtain. The score is the value of the sum of the uh, absolute values of the error terms here. And my best fit is the one that minimizes the score here. Here we will see something which is very typical of what we do when we use that kind of thing, is that because now we are more robust, we also have more uncertainty about what is the, the optimal value of C. We see the curve here is very flat. Of course, there is one that will minimize, it's 69, but we see that the uncertainty about this is very large because the curve is very flat here. Ignoring this uncertainty, I took the minimum and I obtained this curve here. I looked at the best fit. Does it look like Laplace noise? That's the question to ask now. Uh, probably we could say hardly, because we still see that there is a tendency to be, for the noise to be smaller here than there. So we should perhaps do another pass on the model to refine it. But if I do a Laplace QQ plot, which is the same as a normal QQ plot, except we plot the quantiles, of the noise of the residuals against the quantiles of a Laplace distribution. Then I obtain something that's a much better fit, in fact, that, uh, than the Gaussian noise before. So it's probably a reasonable model uh, for this thing here. The last question that we would like to have is to have confidence interval on those parameters here, like, for example, if I'm interested in the slope here, is there strong evidence that there is a congestion collapse? So are we sure that C is, uh, uh, sorry, the slope here, which is D, is there a strong evidence of congestion collapse? So are we sure that D is negative? How do I, the question is, how do I compute the confidence intervals that are shown here? Right. The bad news is when we leave the world of least square, uh, forget about confidence intervals obtained in an easy way. So there is no closed form solution like there was uh, for, uh, for least square. 
In simple cases, like for the median, there is, by looking at all the statistics. In more complicated cases like this one, there might be something you can do with a lot of work. But there's also something you can always do, that we will see now, which is our last topic of this module, which is to use the bootstrap. So the bootstrap is a method that is, if you want, the intellectually easiest method. That's what you do when you don't know what, you, what to do, but you are able to program. You have a computer and you can do simulation. We know how to do simulation. That was the topic of one of the previous modules. And the idea of the bootstrap is to solve problems when we have estimated unknown quantities, like here, the parameters A, B, C, D of my model, when it's too hard because it's not least square or the formulas are too clumsy or perhaps there's no formula that is known or finding a formula might be an entire PhD so if your problem is very important because it's something that has to do with biology perhaps you want to solve it because the problem will still be around in 20 years if you're doing it for in the course of your project and you're, you want to do it quickly then uh, you can do a simulation simulation where you use the data that you have as the best approximation to the unknown distribution. That's our first approximation of the bootstrap. In practice, it's a bit more, there's a number of details to fix that we will do now. So let's consider it if we want to compute the confidence interval. And of course, assume we are in a case where there is not a textbook formula that says how to do it. So we have obtained a parametric model with parameter beta and lambda. That's what we did for the Joe's shop when we assume Laplace noise. Lambda is the intensity of the Laplace noise. Beta is the ABCD parameters. We know how to estimate them by some optimization problem. But I want to find a confidence interval for one of the values of the parameters. For example, say the first coordinate beta 1. Let beta 1 hat be our estimator of beta 1. So beta 1 is in this thinking, again, is non-random, something that's completely fixed, but not known to you. It's hidden. It's the problem. You have just the compiled code of the simulator. You don't know the value of beta, beta 1. But you're able to estimate it. Of course, the estimation depends on the data that you've had. Right? Remember that when we want a confidence interval, we want to find two functions u and v of the data, therefore that are random, that satisfy this quantity, the beta 1, the true beta 1, must be between R two bounds with probability at least 0 0.95. But when I say with probability, in order to be able to formulate a probability, I need to know what are beta and lambda. For every value of beta and lambda, there's a different way of computing the probabilities for my model, right? Because my model is different if I want. So I put that in index here. So that is what a confidence interval is. And the problem is, of course, we don't know what are beta and lambda. Right. So that's the problem. Now, first step. Assume an, an oracle would tell us what are beta and lambda. Right. And assume u and v are things that are very complicated. They are obtained as a result of an algorithm, not given by a closed form, for example. Which is the case here when we do L1 minimization. We obtain u and v or we obtain beta 1, for example, by solving a linear program. So it's not something that we can easily put a formula uh, against it. So, but we know beta and lambda. How would we compute the two value u and v if we would know beta and lambda? Well, we have seen that problem already. It's the problem of finding a 95% coverage interval. So if you want a symmetric one in p-values, you say, I put u beta, the lower bound, as the 2.5% quantile of the distribution of beta 1. Now, what does that mean? Remember, I'm assuming for a moment, I know the true parameters. I am the guy who wrote the simulator. I know how you compute beta 1 hat, even though, even though I'm not able to write this in one formula, but I know how to generate beta 1 hat. So at least in theory, I know what is the distribution of beta 1 hat. Right? So these quantiles are well defined here. 
So, one way to find a confidence interval, if we know beta and lambda, is to find 2.5% and 97.5% quantiles of the distribution of this, right? Now we don't know beta and lambda. So one method that is used by the bootstrap consists in saying, well, I will replace the unknown quantity beta and lambda by their estimated value. I'm still not saying how I will obtain those quantiles. We'll see that in a second. But if I have a method to obtain the quantiles when I know beta and lambda, I will apply this method to my estimates beta hat and lambda hat. If those estimates are not too, too false, that should be reasonable. That's the first step that is used in the bootstrap. So we use, whenever we don't know the estimated parameters, we replace them by our estimate here. So now let's return to the problem of how do I get the quantiles of this beta 1 hat, given that the way I obtain beta 1 hat is easy to do by simulation, but difficult to express analytically. If it's easy to express analytically, you use the analytical expression and, the, and you look up in MATLAB about the CDF and so on. So if it's a normal distribution, you don't do that stuff, of course. But if beta 1 hat, like in our case, is obtained by solving an optimization problem, that's the only thing you can do. So we're in a case where we can easily simulate, but not easily find analytical things then how can we get a confidence interval? Well, we have seen in the simulation course that we can do Monte Carlo simulation. We can do a large number of times, repeat the experiment independently. So capital R is a large number, for example, 999 times. Simulate YI from the model. So here I'm assuming for a moment that I know beta and lambda, so I can simulate uh, yi from the model. I have a linear or non-linear regression model, so if I know the parameter beta and lambda, I can do as many simulations as I want. I, for every replica, I call this a replay experiment, for every replay experiment, I can redo my estimation of the beta hat, right? Solving a linear program. So I will solve a linear program 999 times, and then my estimate of the quantiles are the 2.5% quantile and the 97.5% quantiles, right? This we have seen when we talk about how to estimate a median, then we take the sample median, for example. How to estimate a quantile, then we estimate it by the quantiles of the empirical distribution. What are those quantiles? If R is 999, it is the 25th and the 975th uh, values of those estimates. Since I've done independent estimations here, then I have obtained uh, 999 different estimations. Hopefully they are not too far away. If they are very far away, we'll have very large confidence intervals. So this is what we do to obtain a confidence interval if we know beta and lambda. But of course we don't know beta and lambda, and what we have seen in the previous slide is the bootstrap idea is to replace beta and lambda by the estimated. So if I do exactly this, I am doing what is called parametric bootstrap. Bootstrap means I use the data that I have as a proxy to the unknown distribution. So here the data allowed me to obtain beta and lambda hat, and I, take, I assume those are the true values, and then I do simulation. Bootstrap means that. Bootstrap also means we do Monte Carlo simulation to compute stuff. And parametric bootstrap means we use the estimation of the parameters of the model to do our Monte Carlo simulation. Right. We'll see there's another way of using the bootstrap here. So I've done this here for this uh, job shop here. So what does it mean? I did the estimation that I've shown a, min a minute ago. And a part of the estimation that I did not show before, but now I need it, was to estimate also the lambda, the parameter of the Laplace noise. So I estimated it from my data. And now the parametric bootstrap means I do 999 times, I draw the model, which means I draw residuals from 
Laplace noise with this value that I now consider as, uh, so I, those are my epsilons, and I simulate an artificial data from the fitted model. So the fitted model is this curve here with the value that I've obtained for ABCD, so the hat values, and then I add noise. And the noise I add it by simulating Laplace with this parameter here. So I do one new simulation of the cloud of points, and I do it, and for every simulation I re-estimate my parameter ABCD, and I do that 999 times, and a confidence interval for D is this one, for example, which is the one I've shown before. So we obtain this uncertainty bounds, so which means we had a fairly large uncertainty on D, but allows me to say that all the with 95% probability, all the values I found were negative, so there is congestion collapse here. There is another method which is more. Yes, question. In the previous slide, shouldn't it be like I data points? I correct. It's capital I artificial data points. Yes. Thank you. So what we did here is, what is the only random part in this model, once we know the parameter, is the epsilon. So what we did in the previous case, we draw epsilon from the distribution to which we apply the estimated parameter, parametric bootstrap. There's another more radical method, which is even simpler to implement, and is often used, considers in re to generate the, the noise terms, the epsilon, we don't assume a model, we simply assume that they are independent from a common distribution. That's the only assumption we make. And then we say, I have found capital I estimates of epsilon by my once I have fitted the model, I have an estimate of the epsilons, and I would like to do replay experiments by redrawing the epsilons from the same distribution. The parametric bootstrap will say, estimate lambda and draw from lambda. This other form of bootstrap says, simply repeat the residuals that you have, because the best you can say about these residuals is, well, the best you know is the values here. Any fitting exercise you do is like an intermediary you're doing. Right. Whether one or the other is better is not very clear. We know that there is a bias in the estimated residual, so it might be better to regenerate from the fresh model, but sometimes it's more convenient to regenerate directly from the bootstrap. So concretely, it means the following. I do capital R replay experiment. I so I have already estimated uh, beta hat, right? I compute the residuals and I consider that they are my estimations of the noise terms, EI. Then I put them in one bag, and for each replay experiment, I will draw capital I numbers from this list with replacement. Right? So if I draw without replacement, I'm just shuffling the order, but here I allow repetitions. This is consistent with the idea, with the assumption, that the noise terms are IID. They come from the same distribution. The distribution is unknown, but if I want to generate a number of samples from a distribution that is unknown other than you have a sample, then the best thing to do is to draw at random a sample from this, with replacement. Because if you do no replacement, it's no longer IID, right? Because the, the value you have depend on the values you take you took before. So that's the key thing. You draw them with replacement, and then you do like before. You do artificial data. You do a simulation. You re-estimate for every replay experiment the beta that you have obtained here, and then you sort them and you do a confidence interval by looking at the quantiles of the fitted distribution. I did this uh, for this thing here also, and those are the confidence intervals I've obtained. The only interest of all this complicated bootstrap, or complicated to explain, but not complicated to implement, uh, is to compute confidence intervals. Right? Here it was with uh, uh, parametric bootstraps, 
And here it is with resampling for residuals, you find that the confidence intervals are a bit larger, which is uh, often the case, but not always here. There are pros and cons of using one or the other. A pro of this one is if we're fairly sure that our model is right, in other words, that we have Laplace noise. If we're fairly sure about that, this is safer because we know the residuals are a bit not entirely independent. Uh, we should know, take standardized residuals, but it's impossible to compute them in the general case. So this is safer if we think the model is correct. Here, it has another advantage though, because we draw the residuals from the true estimate, the true residuals we have. Any assumption we made about the residuals will not be used for doing the replay experiments. So if the residuals are not exactly Laplace, but some other distribution that is not very far from Laplace, but is a bit different, then by drawing from residuals, we will generate something that will look like this distribution. So we are more free of distributional assumption when we do bootstrap from residuals. Those are, that's the take home message. So the bootstrap is an idea that is uh, very often used. So if we summarize it, the idea of the bootstrap is to use the data itself and to do Monte Carlo simulation. For example, as a toy example, I applied it also to estimate the mean of a data set, right? which is stupid because we have the ways to estimate the mean. But if I want to estimate the mean of a data set, what would I do? Then with a bootstrap, I draw at random values from my data set with replacement. I compute the mean. I will find different means because I don't have exactly the same replay experiment at every time. And I look at the distribution of my estimates of the mean. And I will treat that as a confidence interval for my prior estimate of the mean. By the way, this is true. This is a way of estimating the distribution, which is valid without assuming normal distribution or even convergence to normal distribution when n is large. So in extreme cases, that might be the only thing we do. Which of the two algorithms here would be correctly implementing what I just said? And the correct answer is A, which is the majority vote. So let's look at what we do here. So here we have replay experiment. And for each in a replay experiment, we draw uh, one integer uniformly between 1 and i. And we set the value of x to be uh, the value. The, so this index, k, this random integer, is our nth value. So this is a correct way of drawing with replacement. With replacement, because whenever I increase n, I redraw k without uh, anything, uh, without uh, remembering what I drew before. So it's quite possible that k takes a value that was already taken before. Here I draw a random permutation. I'm not, exp not saying how we draw a random permutation. That's another story, but that's a classical uh, function that you can easily code or find. But here, by drawing a random permutation, I make sure that the x, the collection, the set of x, is exactly the same set as the initial data, y1, yi, one to one. We only change the order. And we know that if we do that, we don't have a correct implementation of the bootstrap here. So I did that by curiosity uh, with the bootstrap for, the, uh, for two data sets. Uh, that I have here uh, for confidence interval for the mean. And here, uh, it's not so exciting. We find uh, that the formula that assumes 1 over n or 1 over n minus 1 with student or with normal, we saw that they're very close anyhow. And the bootstrap gives, uh, gives the same thing. The bootstrap can be used to, to do a bit more. If we are curious, we could say, when I have this replay experiment, I have obtained a simulation of the 999 val possible values of the estimate of the mean. Right. If those formulas are correct, 
we should see that those estimates of the mean are normally distributed because those values are true under the assumption that the sample mean has a normal distribution. Right? So that may be a way to test that the assumption that underlies the confidence interval for the mean is true by looking at the QQ plot of the bootstrap estimates of the sample mean. We can do that if needed. But admittedly, just to compute a mean, it, perhaps it's an overkill. But for other things, uh, it might be uh, useful. Well, that's all for today and for this uh, module. <laughs>